Now we come to this same slide that says, but that's not what it means to me, Jim. And I know that many of you are thinking that. And the reality is, is it doesn't matter what it means to us. And that's so difficult for us to comprehend and to get through our hearts and our minds that it only matters what it means to him. Certainly most of us would not wear a necklace that was a satanic symbol. But yet we will, we will build churches with symbols that we don't even know are satanic. Uh, we will have holidays that, su that surround themselves with pagan symbols. And yet because we don't know them, we think it's okay. But the reality is, is that the great God of Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he knows what those symbols mean. And so from his perspective, he sees those symbols and it reminds him of when they passed their children through the fire of Molech. It reminds them of the infants that were, that were killed and sacrificed on the altars of Ishtar. It reminds him of all the sun god worship, of all of his, his people that turned their side against Yahweh and served other gods. It's a reminding symbol to him. And for that reason alone, we should put those symbols behind us and get rid of them and burn them like Nehemiah and, uh, and all of the, and Jeremiah and, and the great prophets of old that tore down those high places and they destroyed those pillars. And here they spent their blood uh, in pouring, pouring out their blood and their strength and their children to, to tear down those high places. And here we are building those high places right back up. It doesn't matter what it means to us. It matters what it means to him. And so we need to find out exactly what it means to him. And we're going to do that at the end of this program as we go through some scripture uh, that many of you probably have never read before that are dictating exactly the holidays that we're celebrating today. And we're going to discover whether or not uh, we can actually continue to do these things from our perspective and turn a blind eye to his heart. Now, when do you think the birthday of Nimrod and Tammuz was? On the first day of the year when the sun is reborn. And what day do you think that the sun is reborn? In the middle of the winter, at this winter solstice, December 25th. That's right. That's where we get December 25th on Christmas Day, where we say that Jesus was born. Why did we choose Jesus being born on December 25th? Where did that date come from? Very simple. Jesus was the Son of God. Tammuz was the Son of the Gods. He was the son of his father, Baal. And so the pagans, which early Christianity came right out of paganism in Rome, they were already worshiping the sun god on Sunday in Rome, which is where we get worshiping on Sunday from. It used to be that all of the early Christians worshiped on Saturday, but it was changed to Sunday because all of the pagans worshiped the sun god on his day, Sunday, and they worshiped him on his birthday, on December 25th. So naturally, when Jesus came into the picture and uh, Constantine supposedly got saved in the 300s, they compromised to make it easier for people to convert to Christianity by making Jesus' birthday on the same birthday as, as the sun gods that they were already used to celebrating. And that's where we get December 25th from. One of the largest cultic and pagan celebrations took place during the winter solstice. Why? because this is when the sun is reborn, as that is the time that the days of the year begin to get longer. Thus, the sun god's birthday coincided on that day, the 25th. It originally was the 21st, and then because of the change of the Julian calendar, it got moved to the 25th. We can see here, this is an ancient picture of Nimrod, that all the sun gods from every region might have had different names, but they can all be traced back to the original sun god, Baal, a.k.a. Nimrod. Look at this picture of him with a long beard. You can begin to see where I'm going to go next as we begin to discover what 20, the December 25th holiday, how it gets connected to Santa Claus himself. Some of the different names that Baal had was this. In Persia, it was Mithras. And uh, you can do a study yourself on this. This is incredibly fascinating. If you study the, the, the pagan uh, cultic worship of Mithras, you're going to see tremendous amount of connections to some of the things that we do here in Christianity. This is 500 years before the birth of Jesus, before Yeshua. It was called the birth of the unconquerable son, was Mithras. Osiris and Horus and Ra in Egypt. He was called Attis of Rome. And to celebrate their birthdays, the Romans had a great feast called the Feast of Saturnalia. Guess how long it was? 
12 days. That's right, which is where we get the 12 days of Christmas from, is right from the Feast of Saturnalia, which is over the Feast of the Winter Solstice, or the time of the Winter Solstice. And guess what the Chaldeans called this day? Today we call it Christmas, but back then the Chaldeans called it Yule Day. Do you know what the word Yule literally means? It means the day of the infant. And they were certainly not talking about Jesus. They were talking about Tammuz, who was the son of God, who would one day come back and save them from the world. You see, Satan can't do anything else but take the truth, twist it, and get people to believe a lie. And that's what he did with the story of the birth and the death of, of our Lord is he replicated that in paganism and so at some point his plan was to take the paganism and mix it into Christianity and whenever you mix holy with the profane that the scriptures call that unholy. Yahweh does not accept anything that's unholy. It must be clean. It must be set apart and holy. Kadosh in Hebrew. So does this sound familiar? Let's move to this character called Odin because this is where we're going to get into a little bit more detail of, of our holiday and where some of these symbols come from. Along with the celebration of the sun gods, the Scandinavians also worshipped this god called Odin. He was the god of intoxicating drink, ecstasy, as well as the god of death. And because of the Feast of Saturnalia dealing with all those things, he naturally became uh, the most popular god of the Feast of Saturnalia, uh, which was a sun god which we can trace all the way back to Baal himself. Guess who this character became? Look at him very carefully. What does he look like? The colors are wrong, but this guy became Santa Claus. That's right. Odin, or Woden, was the god of wisdom, magic, and occult knowledge, runes, poetry, and war. His name meant the inspired one. And you're going to begin to see, as we move through these slides, you're going to, to see that, uh, that Santa Claus, or Odin, is awfully familiar to Jesus, or Yeshua, which means salvation. We're going to see a God, Odin, who saves, and we're going to see another one called Yeshua who saves. Now, I want you to pay attention to some of the characteristics as we go through Odin, because it's shocking to see the similarities and how Satan is trying to masquerade as an angel of light, as we know from the scriptures. He was a tall, old man that had a long white beard and carried a spear or a crozier. Remember when we went through the crozier, the serpent crozier. Whoever holds a serpent crozier is connected to the power behind that serpent crozier, which is the serpent himself. Let's continue. He traveled around the world on a white horse that had eight legs, Okay, which was an ancient uh, tradition, the number of transportation. This is where the eight reindeer came from. Now you might say, Jim, there's nine. Originally, there was eight. Rudolph was added in modern times. There was eight reindeer, and it comes from that white horse that Odin traveled around on that had the eight legs. You can look up all of this stuff as very a common knowledge on the internet. In encyclopedias, you can see Odin and, and all the reference material that goes with it. And virtually every version of Claus, he carried a along behind him, a dark helper. These became the elves, okay? So virtually every single version of Claus, there was a dark helper. If you look carefully in that picture, you can see that kind of little demon guy with the long uh, red tongue that comes out of him. These were called Krampuses. Uh, the Krampus, or the dark helpers, followed along, and if the children weren't good, they would beat the children, okay? And so you had the good guy, St. Nicholas, well, eventually it would become St. Nicholas, the Odin, who would come and he would give you gifts if you were good. And if you weren't, then the, uh, the blackjacks or the dark helpers, they would be the ones that would institute uh, the discipline uh, to the children. And we're going to see that. So these Krampuses, which ended up being Santa's helps, uh, excuse me, Santa's elves, According to legend, the Krampus accompanies St. Nicholas during the Christmas season, warning and punishing the bad children. In contrast to St. Nicholas, who gives gifts, gifts to good children. That comes from Wikipedia. Here's another picture of Krampus and the Santa's elves. You can see uh, the picture on your right is that you have, it's almost like a witch's brew, a broom, where the children, uh, the naughty children, are being carried away by a Krampus, which is a combination of a human 
and a goat. Okay, and you see this uh, all throughout uh, history is a human that's mixed with a goat. And I have a teaching on the Nephilim or the sons of God where I kind of go through this, but in a nutshell, on the, on the holiday called Yom Kippur in the Bible, where once a year the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice, there were two goats that were offered. One was called the La Adonai goat, and that goat was offered to Yahweh as uh, to Adonai. And the other goat was called the La Azazel goat. And that goat was taken off into the wilderness and it was pushed over a cliff. And the La Azazel goat was, was where they took the, the, the hands of the high priest and they would incorporate all the sins of Israel onto the head of this goat and then send it off into wilderness to Azazel. Now Azazel was a man goat god, okay, in, in ancient mythology. And so it was said that it was Azazel who caused man to sin. And so all of the sins of mankind for that year, the Israelites, would be placed on the head of the Azazel goat. And this is what we see transferred all the way down into another form of Santa's helper is actually Azazel, if you will, or the Krampus is what they call it today. And the picture on the left you can see is actually a modern day picture of a festival, uh, a Christmas festival, in Germany where they continue to use this celebration and they bring out Krampus or Santa's helpers. This is a modern day picture here. As crazy as this is uh, for us American Christians to believe that this still goes on today, this is a picture of Saint Nicholas and his demons, his Krampus, are still celebrated in Austria, Hungary, Germany, Italy, and all over the world. And so what we're going to show you right now is an actual clip or a short movie of a montage of different videos that we've discovered of where they still make this celebration, still celebrate this all around the world, where they, they literally glorify the demonic part uh, of Christmas in St. Nicholas and these dark helpers. I know, I apologize, it just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? And if that wasn't enough, there are some scholars that believe that the actual song Jingle Bells came from the Krampus Bells that, that were in existence for a long time before that song was ever written, that every time you saw St. Nicholas, he was accompanied by the bells of Christmas, if you will, from his elves. They used to, to have bells that would hang from their necks and as you heard in the video, they would, uh, you, you would hear the bells as, as they announced themselves into the next town that they were going into. And some believe that that's actually where the term uh, the Christmas bells or the bells of Christmas or jingle bells came from. Now we're going to move into discovering exactly where Santa Claus came from. So Odin, how did Odin become Santa Claus? Well, here's the, the rendition or the evolution of Odin becoming Santa Claus. By the 1500s in Holland, there he became Sinterklaas, okay? So Saint Nicholas turned into Sinterklaas, a kind and wise old man with a white beard, white dress, red cloak, a crozier, and he rode on the skies and the roofs of the houses on his white horse, accompanied by his blackjacks, which were the Krampus that we just saw, leaving gifts for people under his sacred tree, the fir tree. He would visit you on his birthday, December 25th, of course, and give you gifts if you've been good, or if you've been bad, his blackjacks would beat you. And uh, it, it's amazing to me that, that these stories 
find themselves in modern uh, Christmas traditions even today. Two and three thousand year old pagan traditions find themselves and now we smile about these traditions. The most famous phrase that Santa Claus ever says is what? Oh, oh, oh. But do we ever stop for just a moment to think where did that come from? Well if you go back in history you begin to find where that phrase actually originated from and here's where it originated from. In the history of Hobgoblin, the author Alan W. Wright reveals Robin itself was a medieval nickname for the devil and Robin's trademark laugh is ho ho ho. Back in the 1600s, Robin Goodfellow played the devil in many, many plays, which plays obviously back then were incredibly important. They didn't have theaters or movies today. So the theater and, the, and plays were were an integral part of society back then. And so before the devil would ever come on stage, he would announce himself by saying, ho, ho, ho. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, where the ho, ho, ho comes from with Santa Claus. By the year 1700, a Dutchman immigrated to North America, brought his Santa Claus with him. The English dialect was then changed to Santa Claus. In 1930, a designer for the Coca-Cola company was trying to get people in the, in the wintertime to buy their drink. So they took their company colors of red and white, borrowed the Santa Claus story, changed a few things, and out came the modern Santa Claus, complete with reindeer and elves. So that 1930 designer borrowed a picture from, the, I think it was the 1800s, and modernized it, added the colors, and out came the Coca-Cola Coca-Cola Santa Claus that we see today, complete with the long white beard and chubby cheeks and the red and white suit. In the 1970s, let's continue. The Second Vatican Council, listen to this, formally stated that no Roman Catholic bishop by the name of Nicholas ever existed. They downgraded St. Nicholas. They took away his sainthood because there was evidence that brought forth to the Vatican that it was possible that he never even existed along with many other saints. Vatican II further confessed that the legends attributed to this saint had no Christian origin and probably came from pagan traditions itself. Okay, And so we're seeing that St. Nicholas uh, most likely was a made-up saint that was connected to sun god or Odin that ended up being Odin. They needed to Christianize it, made a saint out of him, Eventually, the colors got changed. You see the elves come into the picture, and they go from being evil to little cute guys that make toys. That's all American modernization of a very satanic, evil, pagan holiday and origins that go all the way back to the garden itself and its deception. Look here, the World Book Encyclopedia says this, The belief that Santa enters the house through the chimney developed from an old Norse legend. The Norse believed that the goddess Hertha appeared in the fireplace and brought good luck to the home. That's actually where the word hearth comes from, is it comes from Hertha, uh, which was the goddess of the Norse. And so we see that right out of the World Book Encyclopedia, that Santa comes down the chimney, has nothing to do uh, with anything that is good, has everything to do with a god that came through fire. And ladies and gentlemen, I only know one god that goes through fire, and that is uh, Satan himself that will be eventually thrown into the lake of fire. Here we continue. Druid homeowners would leave a treat consisting of milk and pastries to appease this god that came down into their chimney into their fireplace. So there is where we get the idea of milk and cookies for Santa Claus. Um, we, we think we made that up. We think that's cute. But this goes back a long time, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Druids uh, when they would put milk and cookies for their god that came through the fireplace on December 25th on his birthday. So let's ask the question, who is who? Who's who in this world? Is it Santa Claus or is it Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah that we are serving? Which is uh, the God, if you will, that we are putting forth to our children during this time of year. Let's discover some characteristics that are eerily familiar to our Savior and see if we should be connecting them. First of all, Santa Claus is said to have no beginning or end. Jesus has no beginning or end. Santa Claus has his own eternal spirit called the Spirit of Christmas. Jesus has his own eternal spirit called the Spirit of the Living God. 
Santa Claus is all-knowing. Jesus is all-knowing. He writes their names in a book, checks it twice. So does Yeshua. He writes our names in the book of life. Santa Claus, his hair is white as snow. Revelation tells us that Jesus' hair is white as snow. Santa Claus travels during the night. Now you see a little bit of a difference. Jesus travels during the daytime. Everything that Jesus does is in the light. Everything that Santa does is in the dark. Do you see the difference? It's just subtle difference how Satan takes a truth and he just twists it just a little bit. Let's continue. Santa wants to give you everything your flesh desires. Jesus wants to give you everything that you need. Santa enters your house through fire. Certainly, our Lord does not enter our house through fire. And He has a mystical tree, and He loves children. Did you know that Santa has a mystical tree? Where did he get that idea from? Because there is in, in the Bible, there, Yahweh has a mystical tree called the tree of life. It was the tree that separated good and evil. That when you took part of the tree of life, you lived forever. And that tree of life eventually uh, took a, a form in the holy place that lit the entire holy place of the temple, and it was called the menorah. The menorah was the seven-branch candlestick uh, that the Israelites put in the temple, and it was called the tree of life. Let's go to the Oxford English Dictionary. It says, for the definition of devil, this is incredible, the definition of devil is called Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, and in popular rustic speech, devil is called Old Nick. That's right, Old Nick, the very Old Nick that we talk about, that, that we let our children sit on his lap at the department stores, that we watch movies revolving around Old Nick. Well, Old Nick, in the old days, this is what Old Nick used to look like. This is the Old Nick that that Hasatan, Satan, is used to, that's what the devil is called, is Old Nick. Again, it's not what it means to me. And I hope that you understand by now that it's not what it means to me. Uh, it doesn't matter what it means to me. It only matters what it means to him. These things are difficult to swallow. There's no question about it. When I first learned these things, they, were, they shocked me to my core. And then how do I deal with this? How do I apply this to my walk and my, and my spiritual life? We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but the truth is, is please humble yourself to the facts that are being presented to you today and ask the Father what you should do with your own family with these facts. And remember that it's not what it means to us. This is only what it matters to Him. Back to Odin. The main symbol of this mystical being that had godlike powers was the eternal fir tree. This was the, the main symbol. Now you can look on the left-hand side, the main symbol of the true God, Yahweh, in the garden uh, in Genesis to the New Jerusalem in Revelation is the tree of life. It was the menorah, the seven-branched candlestick that stood in the holy place. The Christmas tree. Trees have been worshipped by virtually every pagan culture in the world and was again a major symbol of sun god worship and fertility. It took the place inside uh, the pagan home of the, the obelisk. The, the fir tree took the place of that obelisk as a picture or a symbol of the sun god. That's why they put the sunburst or the eight-pointed star on top of it. The fir tree was said to be magical tree because it remained green all year long. It was decorated in some cultures with fruit, to symbolize new life, and in other cultures it was decorated with 12 candles to honor their sun god, because the, the Feast of Saturnalia was 12 days. That's where you get the 12 days of Christmas from. Today we even sing songs to it, just like they did in the pagan worship rituals. Jeremiah 10 verses 2 and following says, Thus says the Lord, or Yahweh, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree down from the forest, the work of the hands of a workman with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Now, 
many people believe that this particular scripture is talking about Christmas trees themselves. The truth of the matter is this particular scripture is not really connected to Christmas trees as it is the idea that they took and they, they, they went to the woods, they got fir trees, and then they would carve them and they would decorate them with silver and gold. And what I wanted to point out with the scripture is that the whole decorating with silver and gold uh, balls, uh, which actually, believe it or not, are, are representative in ancient cultures as the testicles of the sun god uh, that went on the shaft uh, of, of, of Baal with the symbol of the pagan fertility rite of the sun burst on top of it, that's where they got the silver and gold from. It was the idea that they decorated their idols with silver and gold. So that's what I wanted to pull from this scripture, not necessarily that they're cutting down a Christmas tree. That tradition didn't happen until later, but this is where they got the idea from because idols were decorated with silver and gold. We see again uh, very closely, if you look closely on this Mexican sun god idol that we showed you before, you will see the fir tree. This fir tree ends up becoming, as we know today, what we call the Christmas tree. Boughs of holly, where did this come from? Where did these traditions come from? They would also use the clippings of the evergreen shrubs to decorate their home at this time as an offering and as a symbol of the fertility god, the god of the spring. This would be Ishtar. The mistletoe, where'd the mistletoe come from? Celtic and Teutonic peoples had long considered the mistletoe to have magic powers. It was said to have the ability to heal wounds and increase fertility. The Celts offered it to their gods in prayer and hung mistletoe in their homes in order to ward off evil spirits, okay? And, uh, and I also learned in my research that during the Feast of Saturnalia with the Romans, they would hang this mistletoe up all over the place, and then they would have drunken orgies uh, underneath the mistletoe, and it was said to increase fertility. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why we kiss under the mistletoe. It goes all the way back uh, to the pagan fornication that they did in Rome during the Feast of Saturnalia. The Yule log was a log that they burned in the hearth for 12 days as that was the length of their celebration. It was originally dedicated to Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, to the fertility goddess Easter for bringing forth their savior, Tammuz. They would sacrifice animals and slaves into the fire each night. This was said to keep evil spirits away. Now let's move to the Encyclopedia Americana and its definition of Christmas. It says this, It was according to many authorities not celebrated in the first centuries of the Christian church, as the Christian usage in general was celebrated the death of remarkable persons rather than their birth. A feast was established in memory of the birth of the Savior in the fourth century. In the fifth century, the Western church ordered it to be celebrated forever in the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of of the soul or the sun. So can you see the evolution? Even uh, Encyclopedia Americana is telling us that Christmas was never celebrated by our, our disciples, by the apostles, by our, by our predecessors, even the church fathers. This goes all the way back and wasn't until the fifth century that this feast was incorporated and mandated into Christianity to be celebrated. And look what it says. It says it's to be celebrated forever in the same day as the Roman feast of the birth of the sun. Look at this. This is from the records of the general court here in Massachusetts Bay Colony, May 11th, 1659, says this, to the great dishonor of God and offense of others, it is therefore ordered by this court and the authority thereof that whosoever shall be found observing any such day as Christmas or the like, either by forbearing of labor, feasting, or any other way, upon any such account as aforesaid, Every such person so offending shall pay for every offense five shillings as a fine to the county. As a matter of fact, the very first states to celebrate Christmas was Alabama in 1836 and Louisiana and Arkansas in 1838. It took all the way to the mid-1800s before Christmas was even allowed to be celebrated in the United States. Why would our founders, who were founded in the, the God of the Bible, make it illegal to celebrate Christmas? Because they were not as far removed as we are from the truth. They understood that these things came out of paganism. They understood that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, did not want us to mix things that people used to worship to the gods that He hates 
in worship to Him. Let me ask a question that you might be thinking, but can't we just take something that Satan meant for evil and turn it around for good? He knows my heart, right? Leviticus 18.30 says this, Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came, and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. Mark 7, 7 and 8 says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. The question is, is if we're supposed to worship the Lord 24 hours a day, and we're supposed to put God on, on a pedestal where we worship Him, don't you think we should worship Him in the ways that He has asked us to worship Him and not in the traditions of men, certainly not the traditions of men that are connected to pagan fertility rites and the worship of, of the sun god? Let's move into Deuteronomy chapter 12. This is really uh, the, the king of scriptures, if you will, that give us a good, clear indication of whether or not we can do things just because we are sincere about it. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says this, And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, their obelisk, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Now, when I started my journey and I began to discover all of these things, the very first thing that I, I, I thought to myself after I thought, well, that's not what it means to me, was I thought, well, I can actually take some of these things and Christianize them, and the Lord would certainly be pleased that I'm stealing something from the enemy and giving it to Him. Well, here we have the Israelites crossing over the Jordan River. They're taking over these Canaanite communities, and, and instead of destroying everything exactly the way the Father told them to destroy it, they would take certain things like the altars, which were very difficult to build, and they said, well, let's just not, let's just not take, let's not destroy everything. Let's take this altar, we'll scratch out the name of their God, and we'll put the name of our God. He says, don't you dare do that. Don't you dare take anything that used to be used towards a sun god and Christianize it, throw a little bit of holy water on it, and then offer it to me. I won't accept it, he says. Do not worship the Lord your God in that way. He says, you shall not at all do, as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever's right in our own eyes. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, still in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy here, and you displace them and dwell in their land, listen carefully, in verse 30 it says, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. So what was happening was they were coming into these communities, and they were creative Israelites. They wanted to take some of the, the creative things that the pagans used to serve their gods and borrow those, those ideas to serve the great God Yahweh. And, uh, and Yahweh has this to say about it. He says in verse 31, You shall not worship Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add or take away from it. Period.